and uh, we'll just jump right in. So for everyone that hasn't met us before, my name is Julia Sunny and I'm the founder and CEO of Treehouse. At Treehouse, we are building technology that is there to support allied health providers um, with their care journey with their clients and our technology enables them to stay connected and provide a, a better supportive care. Um, and part of our work that we do at Treehouse is working with experts in order to provide really great education across Canada and across the world since we've had some viewers from all over the world um, on topics that are relevant from preconception all the way to early childhood. And so today we are discussing fertility misconceptions with Dr. Prati Sharma, who is um, a, a known guest on our Ask Me Anything um, series. And so today, um, Dr. Sharma, and for all of those that don't know Dr. Sharma, she's a reproductive endocrinologist at Create Fertility Center in Toronto, Canada, and an expert in her field. So with that, let's jump right into the topic of today. We have quite a few questions that we've been collecting over the last several uh, days and weeks since we decided to, to introduce this topic. So fertility misconceptions, before we get into the questions, did you want to maybe make um, an overarching statement about that um, and, and kind of get us going? Yeah, no, for sure. Um, can you guys hear me? Yes, perfect. Okay, perfect. Because I, yes. I have them on my yeah. earpods. Um, yeah, I think, you know, in this day and age with the internet being so readily available and Dr. Google being at our fingertips, it's only natural that when patients and providers, to be quite frank, are going through this journey that we Google and we look up everything. And particularly okay. when celebrities that we follow and we watch and we see their journeys are saying things, it's almost like a walking advertisement to say, this is real true evidence. And so I think it's really important to separate fact from fiction. And so patients come in all the time and they say, well, so-and-so conceived at 47 with her own eggs um, and it was all over the internet and she advertised it. So it should be me too. And so, you know, as a fertility doctor, I think that's part of my job to tell patients what's really data-driven and evidence-based and what's not so true. And so I think it's important to have conversations like these where people have an open, honest, and non-judgmental space to say, okay, I heard this. Is this correct or is this exactly. not? Exactly. And I think it's, it, you know, part of our education that we do on our platform is really to focus on that evidence based education and education that is coming from trusted sources and not just a tabloid. Um, right. And so part of that is what we're going to start discussing today. Before we jump in, if you want more information about what it is that we're talking about, feel free to click that little arrow above my head and follow Treehouse, but also follow Dr. Prati Sharma and also Create Fertility Center because they are um, a bastion of knowledge. So with that, let's get um, going. And so the first one is um, IVF drugs uh, or medications that you may take uh, can cause early menopause or can lead you to menopause. Um, I'm not going to say who said that. <laughs> I don't know if we need to, um, yeah. but, but let's talk about that, doing IVF and that leading us to menopause. Perfect. Yeah. I think this was a big statement that was sort mm -hmm. of all over the internet and um, you know, patients were coming in and saying, uh, you know, what's this all about? And actually, yeah. to be fair to the person who said this, um, it's not an uncommon concern or question for patients oh. when they come in, because when you think about IVF, and I think everyone understands that IVF is extracting more eggs than you normally produce. And that is the goal of IVF, giving you fertility hormones to make your ovaries make more eggs than you normally do. And so the first question patients always ask, even prior to this statement was, well, are you going to use up all my eggs? If you do IVF in one month and take out 10 or 15 or 20 eggs, yeah. does that yeah. mean I'll have no more eggs left as I go on in life? And that's actually one of the first misconceptions when it comes to fertility treatment. Even though women are born with a certain number of eggs and they go through those eggs as they go from puberty at the age of 10, 11, 12, when they start their menstruations mm -hmm. until menopause and they lose eggs, that's absolute fact. Each month, you're given a certain allotment of eggs, a certain cohort of eggs. And that's actually one of the parameters we use to assess your reserve on day two or three of your cycle. We can see the number of eggs that are available for that cycle. Mm -hmm. And those eggs are use them or lose them. 
So basically, even if you do absolutely nothing or you're on the birth control pill that month, you lose that cohort of eggs. Okay. So when I do IVF on someone, I'm basically rescuing that group of eggs that was provided for that one month. And rather mm -hmm. than you ovulating one of them, you ovulate five or six five. or 10 yeah. or 15. But regardless of what you do, you would lose those eggs anyway. So an an a simple answer to that question is to say, absolutely not. IVF drugs don't cause you to go into premature menopause. They're in fact doing the opposite. They're actually saving eggs that you would otherwise lose. And that's sort of the basis beyond, behind fertility preservation and egg freezing. You're basically saving these eggs that you're losing no matter what as you get older and putting them in the freezer for later use. So for those patients who do IVF a couple of times and who are worried that, oh my gosh, I'm gonna not have any eggs at the end of six months, that's totally not true. Right. What you really have to worry about is just reproductive aging that happens as you get older. Okay. Um, polycystic ovarian syndrome, also known as PCOS, can yeah. be caused by birth control pills. Again, another star, uh, A-list star celebrity said yes. this. Um, let's, let's break that one down a little bit. Yeah. And so, again, this was one that was all over the internet. Um, I think this one's a little confusing because a lot of young women who have polycystic ovary syndrome are put on the birth control pill. So they're kind of tied together. And so I guess to explain this a little better, it starts out with what is polycystic ovary syndrome yes. in a quick tidbit? I mean, we could probably spend a whole nother IG live on this and it would probably be a worthwhile topic because it's yeah. so common. But just in a nutshell, PCOS is a condition where women have irregular periods, typically where they're usually quite long, intervals of 30, 50, 60, even up to a year of not getting periods. Um, mm -hmm. And they have uh, problems with ovulation and often have clinical and laboratory signs of high male hormones. So they often will complain of excessive hair growth, um, sometimes hair loss, mm -hmm. trouble losing weight, acne symptoms. And mm -hmm. so the combination of irregular periods and these high male hormone symptoms is what gives us polycystic, the diagnosis of polycystic ovary syndrome. So many women, especially when they're not trying to conceive early on in their 20s, are put on the birth control pill for two reasons. One is to regulate their cycles because it's highly right. unpredictable. Yeah. If you're bleeding like every six months, you can't predict it. When you bleed, yeah. it's really heavy. You don't know what's going on. Yeah, so right. one gotcha. of the treatments for PCOS is the birth control pill. And the birth control pill has the added benefit that it lowers male hormone levels. So many women will see an improvement in their male hormone symptoms, the mm -hmm. acne, the facial hair, and those kinds of things. And so women are on the pill quite classically from the age of 20 to 30 before they start conceiving. So mm -hmm. I think that's why people associate birth control pills with PCOS because many women with PCOS are put on the birth right. control pill. So the only thing I would say about this is that the real evidence and the real truth behind this is that maybe the birth control pill can mask PCOS, meaning that if you go on the pill and you have PCOS, you'll never know that you have irregular periods. And say you're an 18 to 20 year old who starts being sex sexually active and you actually really do have PCOS and you go on the pill for 10 to 12 years, you'll have regular cycles. You may not feel the acne symptoms so much. And then all of a sudden you're 31, 32, you get off the pill yeah. and you see your cycles being irregular. Of course, it's it's normal to make that association and say, oh, well, I was on the pill for 12 years. That's what caused my PCOS. But what actually happened is you kind of masked and mitigated your PCOS symptoms over those 12 years, which is really a good thing. Yeah. Um, and now the PCOS is showing up because you stopped the pill and you're trying to conceive, if that makes sense. I see. Okay. Okay. So, and, and this is very easy to twist, especially in a tabloid and in press and in media. Um, yeah. I can see how this can get twisted very, very quickly um, and be just thought of as something completely different. And then, and then it explodes. Press. And then, right. it explodes, and then it explodes, it goes viral. And, um, and then we have to have doctors like you to debunk yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I um, think because it's so common, people just see that association. They're like, oh, that must be true. Right, exactly. Um, infertility is mostly a female issue. And yeah. it has nothing to do with a male. Yeah, that one actually gets me kind of upset and all yeah. angry and, you know, <laughs> women power because... You know, I think that as women, we are definitely the more conscientious gender when it comes to um, fertility planning and childbearing. And obviously, that is something that the focus is on the woman for. 
But again, let's go back to the data and the evidence. Yeah. If I were to put up a graph and show the causes of infertility listed, female factor, which can be blocked tubes, low egg reserve, um, or endometriosis or any of the other common female conditions, mm -hmm. that the incidence of that causing infertility is equivalent to male factor, which is up to 20 to 25% of infertility. So if one fourth of infertility is caused by male factor, that's pretty significant. And so I always say to my patients, and half the time the female comes in and says, you know what, do my workup, and then the guy will come in if something doesn't show up on my workup. And truly, I say, it's a couple's issue. Infertility is a couple's problem. And so the male should be tested in parallel and at the same time as the woman. So yeah, I, I think male factor infertility is just as common as some of the common female factors. And so it contributes just as much as things like endometriosis, reduced ovarian reserve, blocked tubes. And so it's very important if you are in a heterosexual relationship that you get your partner checked out as well. Absolutely. And we will be having actually some topics coming out in the following weeks that we will be focusing on mail yes. as well. So stay tuned for that and, and follow along if you haven't done so just yet. Um, we do have one question that came through and I'm actually going to just um, go to the question um, sure. just so that we can kind of change things up a little bit. Um, the question comes from uh, a viewer asking, do the IVF stimulation drugs increase chances of breast cancer or any other reproductive cancers? Great yeah, question. I think this is, this is a great question and a very smart question for patients to ask because you know, it kind of makes perfect sense. You're giving all these extra hormones. We know that certain cancers are dependent on hormones like breast cancer and uterine cancer. So mm -hmm. there's a natural tendency to worry about that, but there's actually science and evidence and studies that have looked at this. And so in a normal overall low risk woman, you would have to do at least six, if not 12 stimulation cycles, which is a lot. I mean, granted, yeah. some patients do do a couple of IUIs and then move to IVF, but most people get pregnant within six cycles. But you would have to do well over six, if not even 12 cycles of stimulation to even slightly elevate your risk of hormone dependent cancers like breast cancer or uterine cancer. The category that I would probably say as a a little or significantly more at risk is those patients that have a predisposition to things like breast cancer or uterine cancer. And those are people who have a genetic mutation like BRCA. Yeah. And that's a huge genetic burden that increases your risk profile for breast and ovarian and sometimes other cancers. Mm -hmm. And so those patients are at more risk because they have a preconceived uh, sensitivity. And so even in those patients, we do recommend treatments like IVF to extract eggs and create embryos and screen for the gene. But we just tailor our protocols a little bit better to keep the estrogen low. We use a medication called letrozole that keeps the estrogen levels low so that the risk is mitigated. The other population I would talk about is those patients who've had breast cancer in the past and you're kind of worried about a recurrence. But, you know, it goes back to the fact that if you are a patient who's survived breast cancer, which is an amazing thing, you want to move on with your life. You want to of potentially course. have kids. And so yeah. I think the oncologists would agree. They usually say, look, get out of your breast cancer and be like three or five years out so that the recurrence risk is not very high. Yeah. And then give yourself like two years to get pregnant and have a baby. And after that two years, go back to your screening or medication for breast cancer to keep it suppressed. Because they too understand that childbearing is important. Yeah. So I think in those higher risk populations, it is important that we tailor our stimulations. We take note of the number of cycles patients are doing. We're cognizant about the risk. But in the average fertility patient, the likelihood of increasing your risk of hormone-dependent cancers is incredibly low. The other thing I like to say when it comes to these types of cancers is getting pregnant, being pregnant, and breastfeeding lowers your risk of these cancers significantly. Okay. So what I tell patients is, okay, let's say you do two IVFs to get pregnant but then you get pregnant once or twice or three times to have your family and in between you breastfeed, now you've lowered your risk of all of these cancers by so much by being pregnant and nursing. And so it all probably evens out and you have your family. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. So let's talk about being on the pill. Some people say, well, I've been on the pill for over 15 years. It's going to delay 
how long or when I'm going to get pregnant. Is that true or false? Or I yeah. mean, I'm guessing there's a lot of factors there. Yeah, fantastic question. And I can't tell you how many patients come in to see me and they give me their story about how they've tried. And they say, you know, I was on the pill. I stopped the pill. I gave myself a three month washout period. And then I started trying to conceive. And again, let's go back to the facts. The data actually shows that women can get pregnant in the cycle after they get off the pill mm -hmm. and their pregnancy rates are the same, if not even potentially increased. And the risk of multiples is actually slightly increased because you're rubbing up your ovaries after being suppressed for so long to ovulate. So pregnancy rates are totally reasonable, equivalent, even higher in the month after the pill. And to go back to the PCOS story, yeah. actually for some women who've been on the pill for a prolonged amount of time and suppressed their male hormone levels and maybe reduced some of those male hormone levels and encouraged their cycles to be a little bit more regular, once you get off the pill, sometimes you see that they actually ovulate better and they get pregnant relatively quickly. The other third thing is that these pills nowadays are such low doses. Patients always worry, well, what if I... Um, I'm on the pill and I miss a day and somehow I ovulated and I got pregnant and I was on the pill for like five days early on in pregnancy. Do I have to terminate the pregnancy? You absolutely don't because um, early on in pregnancy, there's really very little blood flow to the uterus and these pills are so low dose. It's mm -hmm. a low risk, even if you were on the pill for like a week while you knew you were pregnant. I wouldn't advocate for it. I would sort yeah. of say, make sure you know when your cycle is missed, but um, the worry about having a washout period or risks to the pregnancy or um, having to wait a few months is really not necessary. The only other thing I would mention, though, is that some women who were on the pill for a while, they might experience a period of post-pill amenorrhea. So that's a relatively okay. common phenomenon where you stop the pill, you get your first period, and then it takes your body a few months just to start ovulating again because you were suppressed mm -hmm. for so long. And that's quite common. Um, I wouldn't stress out if that happens in the first four to six weeks. Certainly if it okay. goes on longer for two or three months, it's very important to come in and see the doctor because there might be something new going on with your cycles or God forbid a new, uh, you know, early ovarian reserve loss or something like that thyroid issue. And so it's worthwhile getting checked out. Okay, great. Stress does not affect your ability to get pregnant. So yeah. a lot of us, especially the pandemic has been very stressful. Um, let's talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, you know, and I'm the first one not to downplay stress. And I think that almost every patient that's in the infertility clinic is experiencing some degree of stress because this is a huge thing for women and for men and, you know, being able to have a child um, and not, not having it happen at, at the right time, especially for women who are used to, you know, working hard to get what they work hard for is very stressful. So what I tell patients is, look, I think everyone in the clinic is stressed and there's lots of people getting pregnant. So a mild or a moderate degree of stress is actually quite normal. You're invested in the process. And so that in and of itself should not affect um, pregnancy rates and pregnancy outcomes. Um, patients always ask me even while they're pregnant, is stress going to cause a miscarriage? And so there is no data that having low levels of stress is going to complicate your pregnancy or your second or third trimester. I mean, sadly, we have lots of data in patients who've had a, an incredible loss, like the loss of a parent or a child or a spouse during pregnancy, and they do fine. Yeah. On the flip side, however, you want it to be a pleasant journey. And taking all the drugs and coming in for monitoring can be quite stressful. And I think if you speak to our allied health professionals, professionals like the naturopaths and the acupuncturists, I think they do amazing things to alleviate patient stress and um, help them go through the process where they're a lot more happy. And, you know, I think that just makes the journey a lot easier. And, um, you know, anecdotally, I can say that my patients who succeed are often like they take everything with a grain of salt and, yeah. you know, they just sort of breeze through the process. So I think anything you can do to alleviate your stress levels, whether that's counseling or it's a little bit of acupuncture or, you know, taking some, I don't know, supplements to help reduce your anxiety or exercising, which is a big outlet for many people. I think that that is great and can only help your outcome. 
Fantastic. Thank you. And then for all those that have just joined recently, um, you are more than welcome to ask anything in the Q&A and we will answer all of your questions over the next few minutes as we're still live. Um, and, uh, and if you want to learn more about what it is that Dr. Prati Sharma does or what we do at Treehouse, feel free to follow us. Um, and you can do that by clicking that little arrow above my head. So with that, let's talk a little bit more about if you've already had a child and maybe you're trying for your second or your third, um, yeah. infertility can never happen. It's not possible, especially since you've already had one. Um, how could I become infertile or, or, or have fertility issues after one child? Yeah, great question. I would say a good 30, 40% of my practice is what we call secondary infertility. So it's right. women who had a baby naturally mm -hmm. and they're coming in because they struggle with the second. And I would say that the majority of those patients are coming in because they're slightly older. So let's say you have your first baby at 34, 35, 36 naturally, yeah. and then you come to me at 38, 39. This all goes back to natural ovarian aging. So as women get older, they have less eggs and less good quality eggs. And what I say to patients is, in that 30 to 35, 36 year old range, you don't really see it as much because your egg count kind of is stable. The quality mm -hmm. is pretty stable. But when you start getting over that cusp of 36, that's when fertility starts going down more dramatically. And yeah. so that's when we see it. And so it becomes more difficult to conceive. Or, you know, I hear the same story all the time where patients say, I got pregnant on the first try with my first baby. Now okay. it's been six months and I'm still trying and it's not working. All the more reason if you're over 35 to come in and have an evaluation. Mm -hmm. yeah. So typically it's just because of aging ovaries, but at the same time, I will not discount new other factors. So um, sometimes a woman will have one baby and then have two miscarriages and be like, mm -hmm. what's going on? And so right. if you do a check, there might be something in their chromosomes that caused different eggs and sperm to meet at different times. And there's actually a cause that you could mitigate by doing, I don't know, IVF or whatever it is. Yeah. And you never know, speaking about the guys and male factor, a guy could have perfect sperm, but then have gone through something or been sick or yeah. I don't know, changed their lifestyle habits and now their sperm is low. So different right. things can happen. And even for okay. the woman, um, let's say you did, um, you got pregnant naturally and then you had a C-section, you could have scarring mm -hmm. around your fallopian tubes from that surgery. And now mm -hmm. the No, your audio cut out, Dr. Sharma. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Just the last part of this, the fallopian tube and the C-section. Maybe you can restart. Yes, that. I was just going to say, um, if you've had prior surgery, and let's say you did, you got pregnant naturally and then had a C-section, you could perhaps have scarring around your fallopian tubes. And that's now a new cause of infertility. So the bottom line is infertility can happen at any time. Yeah. It could it can happen if you've had a baby naturally, it can happen afterwards, it can happen after you've had one miscarriage and one baby. And so the important thing is to go back to the definitions. If you've been trying for baby one, baby two, or baby three for six months to a year and it's not working, then absolutely a reason to come in and have an evaluation. Okay. All right. So one of our viewers asks us, is it okay to do strength training in months prior to the IVF cycle? What limits should be kept in mind to not cause any harm to fertility? Great yeah. question. It is a great question. Yeah, I that's think a good one. Women are so con like concerned, at, rightfully so, and in a good way about main maintaining a healthy lifestyle and diet and exercise are vital things. I can speak for myself that if someone told me I can't be on the Peloton every day, I'd be <laughs> devastated. And so, and I actually get a lot of Peloton questions from my patients. So what is the right amount of exercise during an IVF cycle? So um, anything in moderation is good. Um, what I do say though, is when you're doing IVF, your ovaries are increasing in size. And so as those ovaries increase in size from stimulation, there is a risk of something called ovarian torsion. And so that's where the ovaries can potentially twist on themselves. And that is a surgical emergency and can be quite dramatic and risky because if it's not corrected by surgery or the ovaries don't untwist, you could potentially even lose your ovary. And the reason I mentioned that is not to scare people, but to say that when you're jumping around and potentially doing a boot camp class, um, you're obviously gonna increase the risk of that happening. So what I usually tell patients is listen to your body. 
um, as you're stimulating to go for a walk or do a light 20 minute um, ride on the Peloton is totally yeah. reasonable. But if you start feeling pressure or crampy or something doesn't feel right, kind of tone back down. So I would arguably say with the weight training question that I actually don't mind light arm weights and leg weights. I think that's probably actually safer than some of these high impact, uh, high intensity cardio classes where you're doing, um, you know, uh, knee high running and stuff like that, that right. could yeah. potentially increase the ovaries twisting on themselves. But really the end all be all is to um, listen to your body. Yeah. And of course, exercise is always great and the blood flow and everything. So um, um, apologies, my son is running in the background. If you can hear him, of course, when I'm on an IGTV, it's, we might as well just, you know, battle around the house. <laughs> so, um, okay, one of our last questions before we end for today is, again, it goes back a little bit back to fertility and declining after the age of 35. And saying that really only later teens um, are the most fertile times during um, a woman's age. So let's talk a little bit about fertility in the early 20s or late teens um, and then how and why it would affect um, uh, someone that's after 35 and they're, they're a bit worried. I mean, we've gone through quite a few of these um, um, infertility uh, issues after the age of 35, but let's talk a little bit more about, about that before we close for the yeah. Yeah. yeah, so I think, um, uh, you know, going back to the facts, because this talk was about busting um, fertility myths, yes. I think, you know, the central dogma of reproduction is reproductive aging. So what we do yes. know is that a woman, a woman is born, born with a finite number of eggs. That number varies, but most of yeah. the time, you know, it's, you know, you're born with a couple hundred thousand, um, more or less. At puberty, you have a hundred thousand, and at menopause, there's a couple hundred. And as you get older, you lose the best eggs first, and the ones that you have left at menopause are sort of the bottom of the barrel. And that's just reproductive aging. Yeah. And so it's actually interesting when you look at fertility and fertility rates and egg quality in very young patients, sort of medium young patients. Um, 35 to 37 and then over 40, it's interesting when you look at that teenage population of let's say 18 to 21 or mm -hmm. 15 to 21, mm -hmm. they have so many eggs. They probably have a large number of bad eggs and a large number of good eggs. So okay. it's actually not the optimal time to stimulate a woman, let's say if they want to be an egg donor at 18 okay. um, or if they want to freeze their eggs, that is not the optimal time because their body just has so many because they're starting out. So you're probably going to get a bunch of bad eggs and a bunch of good eggs because the body's just trying to balance itself out and probably has a, it has something to do with the fact how, of how when teenagers have irregular periods in the beginning, they're just trying mm -hmm. to sort of iron yeah. out their cycles yeah. and normalize. So yeah. once you get to like that sweet spot of 24, 23, 24, 25, your yeah. body's in a regular um, right sort on. of schedule and yeah. rhythm. Yeah. And so that's truly when you have the best eggs. But, you know, we need a dose of reality here. Like most 25-year-olds yeah. aren't having a baby. Yeah. And truth be told, while I would love it if every one of my single 25-year-olds came in and did IVF to freeze their eggs so that yeah. they have these beautiful eggs on ice for when they're in their mid-30s, that would be great. But I think, you know, psychology dictates that women in their 20s are not probably not for the most part thinking of fertility so much. So really I kind of focus on that cohort of women between the ages of 28 and 34. So that is really the sweet spot where you have like your mental mindset. You think, okay, I do eventually want kids. Yeah. Um, certainly if you're married or in a relationship that you're ready to childbear, it's different. But if you're not, 28 to 34 is really that sweet spot where I would say it's good to come in and get a fertility evaluation, see where your fertility lies, and then consider things like fertility preservation. Once you get to 35, 37, 39, 40, that's mm -hmm. when fertility can start to decline. But every woman's different. It's very individualistic. Yes. I could take 10 35-year-olds and they all would have different fertility levels. Hopefully they're all normal, but yeah. one might have low normal, one might have super normal, one might be right. like higher than we expect. So yeah. everybody's on a different trajectory. And so there's always and that's a good reminder for everyone yeah. just again don't compare yourself just to the no. to the number that is associated to your age 
Yeah, for sure. And yeah. so I think everybody's trend is different and everybody's um, decline is different. So that's why I say there's no, um, no time is too early to come in and do an evaluation because at least you get a baseline. But yeah. that baseline needs to be taken with a grain of salt. As you said, don't compare. And I think what yeah. your numbers look like doesn't necessarily predict whether we, you'd be able to get pregnant naturally or not. It's just used as a guide to say, okay, let's freeze eggs or let's see where you are at in terms of your timeline of having kids. And and so I think following that timeline over the years will sort of give you an idea of where your fertility is headed. But in general, yes, reproductive aging is a real thing. And it's, it's a fact that as women get older, their fertility declines. And so I think that goes along a little bit with one of those misconceptions that, um, and comparisons, like you said, because although there is a hereditary component, um, you know, when patients say, well, my great grandmother had a child at 45, yeah. You know, even though that might be true, that doesn't mean you're going to be able to have right. a child exactly. at 45. Everybody's situation is different. And she might have just gotten incredibly lucky that, you know, yeah. she ovulated a good egg. Yeah, no, absolutely. A great reminder. And and um, I think, you know, it was very important that we went through a lot of these topics because they are topics that are trendy. They are trending. They sometimes go viral. And often people who um, are reading about them, they may think, well, maybe that'll affect me. Or um, yeah. they kind of reflect upon themselves and think, oh, well, maybe this is going to you know, impact the way that I might start my family. So yes. I'm very happy that we took the time to, to walk through, again, so many interesting topics. Um, if you weren't able to join us from the top of the hour, that is okay because we will have this IGTV Live saved for you to, to listen as many times as you want uh, to what it is that Dr. Sharma shared with us today. Um, Dr. Sharma, we thank you so much for taking the time on this um, Good Friday here in Canada to, to walk through fertility misconceptions and answer some of the questions from our viewers, but also the questions that we've collected over the last couple of days and weeks. Thank you. I think you hit all the high points and, um, you know, this is great. I think it was a great topic. Great. We'll see you again soon and you have a great long weekend. Bye, you everyone. Too. Bye, everybody. Take care. Bye.